The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Today we've got a, uh, an individual who's going to regale us with his background, which um, is a bit unique. It's, um, it's not your typical way of getting into financial planning, but geez, he's made up for lost time. Without any further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Pete Monaghan from EJM to the Engine Room. How are you, Pete? Good, Roxy. Great to see you. And by the way, thank you very much for making the, the trip uh, up to Sydney. Um, it'd be most appreciated. It's always good to be in person. So, um, but, but I thought I might just kick off. This is about the engine room, and you have built an engine room. But before we get into that, just a bit about yourself, how you've managed to get into financial services and make your way into that kind of operational part of, of a larger business. Yeah, it's a bit different than most, Roxy. Um, I, was at, I was at uni doing a business making a finance degree back in the 90s and had no interest in a career in it, but I knew I needed to finish the degree. Um, working pubs, etc. Did you have an interest in pubs, Pete? I was pretty good at pubs, both uh, both sides of the bar, and uh, ended up being poached to go and work at the local yacht club, which is Sandringham Yacht Club, Melbourne's or uh, Victoria's biggest yacht club, and sort of got stuck there in a way. Um, ended up running that, uh, ended up there for seven and a half years, but it was the first in a long line of jobs where I've got no idea what I'm doing, and sometimes I actually just refer to myself as a fraud because... I run a yacht club and I don't know how to sail or drive a boat. Um, I moved from there into being GM of a cleaning and restoration business, fire damage, flood damage, etc. And uh, I certainly get feedback at home that um, I'm no expert at cleaning. Um, I then, uh, there's a bit of a milestone where uh, I got a call from my uh, brother-in-law's sister one day and she said, look, um, Westpac are looking for bank managers and I think the job would be perfect for you. They want certain amount of bank managers to come from outside of the industry to bring that external viewpoint. And I thought, well, I've got a banking and finance degree in my back pocket that I've never used, so I might cash that ticket in. So I uh, went for an interview there and no idea what I was getting into, but you know, the crazy people at Westpac kindly gave me a role. And uh, four years as a bank manager, and I, and I really loved parts of it and I really hated parts of it, big corporates. You know, big corporate banks don't exactly always operate maybe in line with my moral compass, um, but the part of... To steal a, a sailing phrase. Yeah, yeah, correct. But uh, the part of it I really liked was the financial planning part. So that's where I actually found that it makes a real difference in people's lives. Um, selling people credit cards doesn't, but giving them really good financial advice makes a tangible difference. So after getting that four years of sort of corporate experience, uh, seven bosses in, in, inside four years, I thought, wouldn't mind getting into something where I can actually make more of an influence myself. And so I went and targeted a, targeted a role in the financial services industry, but specifically in financial planning, um, but no interest in financial planning itself. So um, just... Well, no, to be clear, you loved financial planning. You just didn't want to be the financial planner. Don't want to be a practitioner. That's so right. just like everything else, I've ended up in a role where I can't do the core skill. Um, but I think it actually gives me a competitive advantage in the market because anytime you can do the core skill, you get dragged back into doing it. Absolutely. 
Um, even as a bank manager, I couldn't do a transaction, right? So in other branches, the bank manager would be somebody calls in sick, they'd be standing there, you know, doing transactions all day. In my branch, my team just needed to work harder and they knew they were happy to lift. So my focus has always been around culture um, and creating an environment where we sponsor the success of the individuals within our business. They own it, we sponsor it, and if we do the sponsoring well enough and we recruit and create an environment for them to flourish, I actually just don't have to worry too much about business outcomes because if I can help people be successful individually within the business, then the business outcomes are naturally delivered. So, so it sounds like that's that's your motivations, and that, that's been there regardless of of when of what, what you started with. And I, I create the analogy of, of 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 the yacht club and then the the restoration. Well, um, I don't know if you're an '80s child, but a bit of a bottom of the harbour, and then maybe cleaning some some money. But maybe that was why you got the job <laughs> in the first place. But but yourself personally, so you went from the the bank, and 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 where where specific did you go? Did you go to a small business, a medium-sized business? Maybe no, give us some so, insights. So ended up at EJM, um, EJM Financial Services. EJM's been going for 30 years now. It had been going for about 20 at the time. And, and probably one of the things that I think is really um, – that I really liked about the business was that the founder, Manny, who's a, a, a friend and a mentor of mine, um, he realized that he was really good at the client stuff and he really enjoyed the client stuff and he didn't – allow himself to get dragged into the operational side, which is probably not his greatest strength and certainly not his greatest interest. So I think that a lot of people who are founders and they grow the business feel that they have to go and be the one that actually runs it day to day. Um, and I think pretty early on, Manny always realised that he could influence a business in, in much more ways by being involved at a high level around the strategy, but not the daily execution of that strategy. So I came on board as ops manager in 2014. I... Became general manager probably about three years after that when Manny took a further step out. Uh, and as part of the succession plan, I took over as CEO last uh, probably a year and a half ago, nearly two years ago, and took over the CEO role, which means you know, I fully now own the strategy. And Manny's still there pretty much. You know, I'll go to him around the strategy. Brendan, who's our other individual shareholder, will have an equal say in all of that. Um, but they're off doing their client stuff and I'm off you know, running the business. And I suppose, firstly, congratulations. Um, you know, the, this podcast is all about, um, you know, the, getting the role of practice manager and general manager. But right now, you've, you've, you've just cracked that glass ceiling. It's, um, historically, people in financial services or financial planning practices, the CEOs have been the business writer. Um, and it's also a real shout out to, to Manny, as you've said, for that self-awareness to know what he's strong at and, and, and what he's not. And then obviously to create an environment so that, that, that you can then now craft something as much in, in your kind of, uh, mold as it was. So, um, uh, that, that level of self-awareness, um, you probably stumbled onto a, a good opportunity because there's probably people listening right now that go, I'm this close, but geez, I wish I had that other person on the other side of the ledger who understood that that where I'm strong, they're weak, and where I'm weak, they're strong. So, um, uh, big shout out. So, so now you've you've done that. So you you're Melbourne based. Um, um, a little bit more about yourself. Um, family man. Yep. So, yep, family man. Uh, Melbourne based, born, bred. I think I got out for about a year at some stage whilst backpacking, but um, I don't really like being too far away from the MCG. So it's sort of that bungee cord that pulls me back. Uh, family man, three uh, beautiful kids and a, and a lovely wife, Carly. Uh, my kids are Ellie, who's four, who um, at some stage I think she'll run the world because she runs our household. <laughs> um, you know, Patty, who's seven, who um, is addicted to every sport. I caught him watching lacrosse the other day, which even for him I thought was extreme, but right. um, KO's his best yeah, friend. Yeah, pay per view lacrosse is quite quite, yeah. quite out there on the edge, yeah. isn't it? So, uh, and, uh, and, and Isabel, who's, uh, who's nine and... Uh, um, a beautiful soul and very quickly turning in from a little girl to a, a young lady and um, bringing a lot of joy and, uh, and a lot of attitude along with that. Well, like, like, like everyone who's good and, um, sort of running running and being part of a family, it's, it's good to know the pecking order. I always look at my Medicare card and realise that I'm one rank below the dog. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when, when, so, so that's how you've managed to get there um, into the role you find yourself today at EJM and and we have given um, credit to the rest of the team there at EJM. But maybe if I could just change gears and get a real feel for um, the practice that you, you're now running. You're now leading, but you were running, and now you're basically straddling those. Yep. Um, just if you can give us an overview of, of maybe the org structure, the, of what kind of 
business you're in as far as the types of clients you work on <coughs> and just, just a bit more meat around um, the whole EJM operations, yeah. please. So we've been through a big evolution over the last few years, like many have, post-Royal Commission and interruptions and, uh, uh, to revenue streams and it's very hard to sort of um, – compare where we are today and where we were a few years ago. And and one thing I'm really proud of of the team that we've got, both from a, you know, a, a board level strategy and then the amazing team that work with us, is they've all gone through a journey and, and enabled us to change really, really quickly. And the business is unrecognisable, but it's a thousand times better than it was three years ago. Well, what so, makes you say that? Brendan, who's one of our directors, uh, Brendan Cairns, um, you know, who, who I believe, you know, um, as passionate about financial advice as any advisor I've ever met, um, and I think he should be you know, up there as you know he, he will be the best coach of advisors. So anybody who gets time with him is lucky. But when we when we sort of were trying to work out who our who our ideal clients were and what we've done in the past, he he came up with this, and I loved it, and said, "What was our target market three years ago?" And and the clients he said clients needed to have make two criteria to be a client of EJM. They needed a heartbeat and a checkbook. And it's true. We were, yeah, you know, we were out there trying to get clients, not get specific clients. So we've had a real transformation in, in, in how we want to approach the business and how we want to reshape the business. And we've done a lot in the last three years and we've got a fair bit to still go. And what, what, what typically does a, it, so as of 2023, yeah. what are the type of clients that, that not only uh, are you attracting that, that you feel you're good at? Yeah. So. Like everyone, we've still got a large percentage of our book that is you know, retirees. And I think the number one thing we do for retirees is make them comfortable. It's that are you okay index, right? So we deliver on that in spades. The focus though is we're not targeting retirees. We're good at that, but we need to make sure that we've got the retirees of the future. So there's three key um, focus areas or three key, three key targets that we want to, uh, that we want to search for. The first is we do really well with young professionals, um, basically households with 200 grand or more uh, in income because we can accelerate their wealth creation um, and we can get them connected. So we're a business that is driven by our mission, which is creating happiness. So for a, for a young professional, we know what their happiness looks like. We know what so just to pause, so your mission is creating happiness. Yeah. I'm looking also at your website and you've got EGM happiness stories on your website. Yeah. So so it's not a throwaway line. No, no, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. It's a huge part of what we do, um, but we sort of work out well. What's the happiness for a for a you know a forty year old person with you know two kids and a mortgage? And we understand that that's going to mainly be around cash flow pressures and those sorts of things. So, how can we deliver a solution that fits them? Um, we have a lot of success with um, with SMEs, you know, small to medium businesses. We find that they're really open to advice because they get advice in their business on a lot of things so that they're not, oh, I can probably sort this out myself. They're naturally wanting advice and they're happy to, they're happy to pay for it and they're happy to get the benefits of it. Um, and then pre-retirees, you know, it's, it's an obvious market for everybody, but there's a lot of people that just can't get into the headspace around when they need to start making decisions for their future and that time in their life when retirement starts to be a consideration, kids might be getting older, mortgages might be paid off. Obviously, we can make a bigger, quicker difference for those for those clients. So you're giving us an idea of, 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 of the evolution and the honesty around the, the heartbeat in the, in the checkbook. Um, been a few years since the check's been written in this yeah. country. So, so a shout out to Brendan who's showing his age. But right now, that how how do you how have you arranged your team to be able to deliver for those three segments? Well, so to give me an idea of 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 the people involved, how, how you organise the structure in your business. Yeah, so I'm really excited this year because I started back in January, and for the first time in my nearly ten years in the business, I've actually got an org structure that I think um, works really well. I think I capped out personally. Is that because you're the CEO now? So that's <laughs> well. So, so I've actually we've, we've got enough scale where we can actually have some key people doing some key roles Great. rather than Pete Monaghan, you know, doing some things okay and other things really badly, but no one else is around to do it. So um, really exciting this year. We've now got that management structure. So we've got myself, but I think I capped out at twenty two direct reports at one stage. So how many people in EJM? Forty five. Forty five. So yeah, okay. Across five sites. Yep. So five physical sites. Five physical sites plus yep. an offshore team. Okay. Okay. We'll come to that. We'll come to all that later. So yeah. forty-five. So it's um, 
Um, that's that's a, a big team, and you you had twenty two of those as direct reports. Yeah. So <laughs> now now it's great. So Brendan, who I talked about earlier, has moved into what we call an advice coach role. Um, so he's in a hybrid senior financial planner slash advice coach, and and his uh, pathway now is to be head of advice in the future when we get to a scale where we need a full time head of advice. But that advice coach role is already showing dividends because the advisors now have a weekly check-in with someone who's a practitioner who's very, very good at what they do. Um, we have individual business plans for each advisor that they draw up themselves and they get checked in on weekly to see how they're going. So, so we're going to talk a bit about that in, in people and culture. So I love that, individual yeah. business plan. How many ARs do you have? Uh, we've got 11. 11 ARs? And, um, yeah. Uh, and, and they're supported by how many um, people in your support team, like client service? Yeah, um, I actually don't know the FTE number off the top of my head, uh, but yeah, there's around about 30. Okay. So, and then, um, the, and then the rest in management. So, but you've got, you've got a three to one support for your ARs, is yeah, what you're Which you is probably told. closer to two when we look at FTE because we've got quite a few part timers. Okay. Okay. So, two to, so you, 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 your 11 advisors are, are supported, um, by, by two people and, and, yeah. and how, how, um, and how is your advice produced? Yeah. So, we run, uh, pretty simply, we call it the advice factory. Yeah. Right? So we've got the advisors who are the people who go out there and have the really good conversations and it's very much goals-based advice. Um, but advisors are really good at that and most of them aren't that good at the admin. So what we do is we try and take everything off them that we can and we do that by a mixture of onshore and offshore support. Free up their time to do what they're good at. And also, we're a business that talks about creating happiness so we need to have an engaged workforce. So why have them doing stuff that they really don't like doing? Oh, absolutely. And I think if you've nailed it there, unhappy advisors will not attract happy people. Correct. Um, and with your, your organizational structure, is it, they, is it in a pod system or is it, is it a collective or yeah, how have so, you arranged that, Pete? So I'll go back to the org structure. Um, so you've now got myself. We've got Brendan, who's a hybrid, but effectively it's a head of advice role. Um, then we have Manny, who's, you know, really smartly as part of the succession plan, wants to make sure that his legacy is as big as it can be. So he's been an exceptional advisor, but now he's in a business-to-business -business role. So we call it Chief Growth Officer. Um, and he's doing business-to-business -business work. So he's generating leads for the business via EJM having a relationship with multiple accountants, lawyers, brokers, et cetera, et cetera, um, rather than it just be one person getting them and then servicing them themselves. And also working on a few other side growth projects for us, you know, some generating acquisition opportunities because we have a, a, a very steep growth uh, ambition to be, have 15,000 clients by 2033. Okay. So um, wh how many have you got at the moment? Uh, 14, 1,400. 1,400 and you want to get to 15,000. So it sounds like there's going to be a combination of organic and, and inorganic or, or acquisitions or, or mergers. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, we'll talk a bit about that as well because yeah. – um, um, that's a that's a very very ambitious uh, target, but yeah. um, I have no doubt that you you built the, the structure so far yeah. to kick off. So yeah, so if I go back, we've got we've got Brendan in that sort of head of advice. We've got Manny in the chief growth officer role, which um, which is in its infancy but working really well. We've now got a a, a permanent uh, compliance manager, Carly, who's um, exceptional at challenging the status quo and going, do we really need to do it that way? Hey, what's the policy and getting the most efficient way to do it? Um, and then we've got um, Yanita Haydar, who's our operations manager, and she's been with me the whole journey. So she was a client service officer when I started and she you know, then went into a services manager and then our operations manager. So her and I have been the two full-time management in the business for you know, as long as I can remember now. So I've got an awesome structure there um, where now my job is to coach the coach, you know, um, so I'm trying to catch up with four people a week rather than 22 people a week and see what's happening in the business, which frees me up to do other things that are under my remit, which is, you know, own the strategy, own the M&A work, um, own the uh, key stakeholder relationships, you know, so I can do this sort of stuff and, 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 and you know, be out there and people can get to know us because, you know, we're on an exciting Exciting journey. Well, you're, you're intending on being 10 times the size by, in the next 10 years. Correct. So, so um, yeah. if people don't know you, they probably will in the next 10 years. When, then, when, 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 when you're talking about your, um, uh, your, your, your advice, um, or the org structure, um, are you self-licensed? You're licensed? Maybe give us a feel for yeah. sort of the foundation. Um, uh, you mentioned you've got onshore and offshore. I'm, I'm aware of that. Maybe if you want to flesh out it. More yeah. of how that works as, as a one-team philosophy, yeah. which we've spoken about. 
So from a licensee perspective, um, we're an AMP, FP practice. Um, Manny worked at AMP, so when he left AMP to start his own practice, it was a natural, it was a natural fit uh, 30 years ago. We have been, you know, we've been with them for 30 years. I've known no difference in the last 10 years. Um, but like us, they've been through a fairly big transformation in, in recent years, and that's had plenty of media coverage. Um, I think they're, the dust is settling on that now and that the leadership team there is you know, doing a really good job somehow improving the licensee offering whilst you know, getting themselves into a financially stable position. Um, so you know, we're pretty happy with the, the new management structure within AMP. Um, from a, um, how that fits into how we do advice, fundamentally um, they're our licensee but we're EJM. Um, so we'll work within their guidelines. We have uh, a partnership manager with them, Adriana, who's been connected with our business forever, and she's a superstar. Um, and, and she's our main point of conduit with the licensee. Um, but she'll also sit there and be a sounding board for strategy or if we've got a, an HR challenge, we give her a call. So it, work, it works really well. And, and it's, as part of being you know, EJM, um, do you guys – how do you – uh, how do you manage the the assets when the clients give them to you? Do you, do you run a, like an MDA, an SMA? Maybe yeah. gives a feel yeah. for for that because without some sort of structure on on that, the, the chances of getting to fourteen thousand without going crazy is quite low. So yeah. so so, what, what so, so we're uh, traditionally we run model portfolios uh, and then do some direct shares for the clients that want direct shares. Um, we moved uh, and introduced our own SMA last year uh, in about May. Um, and we've had some really good inflows there, um, and we're getting the benefits to the client of you know, actively managed accounts, but we're also getting the benefits to the business where you know, we're finding an efficiency, and we're now having better conversations at, you know, we call them progress checks, what the industry probably calls a review. Um, we're having better conversations with, with clients about where they want to go, how they're going against the goal, what's really important, not you know, going through portfolio reports and Etc. Because most of our clients actually just want us to do that and trust that we can do it. So that's work, that's working a lot better. And do you, um, given the the demographic of of, of clients that you and that you've you've had, but also the ones you've targeted, um, is life insurance does that play a role in 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 the EJM advice profile? Yeah, it does, and it, and it always has. But like most in the industry, it's 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 got a lot harder. So if I look at it from a the percentage of our of our new clients that come on board that end up with um, personal insurance through us it's certainly decreased over the last five years, but it's something that we're we're addressing at the moment. You know, trying to find ways to do it more efficiently, trying to find ways to. You know, there's no clean skins anymore, but how do we do it so that it's easier um, and that we can we can cost effectively deliver advice in that space because yeah. the the time and money that we spend on it is is challenging. And 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 um, just. Some more information about the, the mechanics of your business. Yeah. Tell me a bit about um, your tech stack and, and, and any journey you've been on there. Yeah. So we have five sites and a couple of those are via acquisition in, in the last uh, three years. So Let's, we, maybe before we go on, rattle them off. Where are they? Yeah. So we're, we're Melbourne. Which is, which is the, the, the spiritual Head home. Yep. yep. And we've got uh, Wangaratta, which we've been in for about 12 years, uh, 13 years maybe. Uh, Wodonga, which we've been in for three Geelong, uh, we're coming up to two years, and Bendigo is about uh, a year. So we've just ticked over a year at Bendigo. It's actually Eagle Hawk, uh, and I always need to remember that. But when I'm talking to people who might not know this, you know, a small town just next to Bendigo, I tend to call it Bendigo. Well, Eagle Hawk does sound pretty cool. Yeah. And, and your natural aversion to the Murray River's been noted. <laughs> so, um, okay, so we'll continue on. Sorry, I just wanted to get a, paint yeah. that picture. So you've really taken a tilt on... Um, uh, on on those those areas, and that's probably where a lot of your SMEs are coming from as well. So you know those large those large towns, um, the wealthy people quite often are self made, and whether it be agri or or industry, so um, well done. So the tech stack, let's yeah. get back. So on, the tech on, stack. So um, we're pretty vanilla on our tech stack, and we know that it's an area that we need to de- develop. Um, being part of a big licensee, you know, we use the the, the AMP version of of X plan. Um, we're on the AMP version of Salesforce uh, as a CRM. Um, we are, you know, embarrassingly, we're, we're managing some of what we do via spreadsheets <laughs> uh, for a lot of our reporting. Um, so we're always on the lookout, um, and that's a 2023 project to work out, but work out what our, what our future tech stack's going to be. Um, and we're, we're, we're some, something that we desperately need to sort out is uh, 
tech stack solution that's going to do some automated communication with our clients because we're just too slow on the on the take up in that space. So you're too slow in in in, in responding to clients or communicating proactively. Proactively. Yeah. 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 Well, you're when, not you're not Robinson Crusoe there, no. and and that's something that it needs to be addressed as you as you get that scale. Um, so, and we're constantly we have, we've had five meetings in the last two weeks with different tech companies trying to work out the solution. Uh, five years ago, we did a study tour to the states where a couple of our team went over to the international FBA conference, and no one seems to have this tech stack thing scum. No, that's why it's called a tech stack, not just tell us the tech that you use. Yeah. So, um, um, I'm always curious to ask that, but but as you know, it's only as strong as the the the, the, the purpose. The motivation and the values of the business and, and having a clear articulation of the types of clients and people would be there. So of your 11 ARs that you've got there, um, so maybe give us a bit of a feel for, um, uh, what, what, how, how they get managed by, by, um, or sorry, how, how they get managed every week or every, every month and how they interact with their operations team. Yep. Is it, is it, <coughs> is it close or is it sort of distant? No, like, it's, it's close. So every single person in our business has a sponsor. So we use the term sponsor. Um, so you know, I sponsor my department head success. They own their success and then they sponsor their team success and their team own their success. So each advisor has that advice coach. There's a structured frequency as to how, how often they catch up and there's a structure to those catch-ups. Um, so yeah, if we've got somebody who's just come out of a PY year, and they're doing their first year as an, as an advisor or their second year as an advisor, then that's going to be weekly. If you've got someone who's you know, flat out with 200 plus clients and you know, looking after a million dollars worth of revenue and reasonably self-sufficient, um, then it might be monthly. Yep. Um, but we go back a step. We actually rolled out a capability assessment for our advisors last year. Um, and I think I came up with 49 questions, so it wasn't small. And it, it was all in categories. So it was, you know, what do you like at revenue generation? What do you like at compliance? What do you like at soft skills? You know, how are you at positioning our mission of creating happiness to our clients? Um, how are you at closing a sale? And I, and I don't avoid that word sale, right? Because if we can give great advice, but if clients don't want to take it up, we're making no difference to anyone. Oh, look, the reality is that a big part of our job is to get people to do things they know they should do in a time frame they otherwise wouldn't. Yeah. And so if the byproduct of that statement is, Get closing and sale, then 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 I think we should all own that. Yeah. So capability assessment, everyone rates themselves on a scale of one to five on 49 key questions. The advice coach then goes and has a look at the answers and sort of goes, okay. And and the challenge I put to my advice coaches, because we've got two, we've got Jan as well in our Geelong office, who was previously practice principal and um, retired out of that role and is just doing a day a week. Um, and, and it's awesome because you've got the knowledge of the business and a great relationship with our advisors there. And I challenged them and said, "Cool, now your job is to go and validate this." And we sat down and we did some we did some uh, some demos and we'd look and we had uh, we had advisors saying, "Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm a two in this." And we go, "No, no, you're better than that." So let's get on the same page. We also had some areas where advisors thought they were really good, and when we went to the data maybe to validate, or if we sat down and said, "Okay, give me your uh, give me your pitch on on our our advice costs versus the." You know, um, the benefits they're going to receive. Some of it wasn't quite where probably the advisors thought they were. I, at. I can't, I can't believe that an advisor might exaggerate. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just shocking for me to hear that. Yeah. So that, that then left us with a baseline, right? We had honest conversations. We know where we're at. And once we all agree where we're at, it's quite easy to move forward. So it's exactly what you do for your clients. Where are you at today? Where do you want to be? What's the pathway to get you there? And back to the, 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 the business structure. Do you offer other services outside of uh, traditional financial planning to your clients? Yeah. So we do lending. Um, we do lending out of our Wangaratta office um, and we've traditionally done it out of our Melbourne office as well. Um, but we are looking uh, – we've got a good relationship now with a, a, a good-sized broking firm that has um, a, a, great, a greater experience than we do in this space and provides a great service. Um, so we're, we're looking now at – you know. Do we want to continue in this space or do we want to just go, that might be something that we do at JV and, and outsource that effectively via a JV? Yeah, well, um, look, I think increasingly um, a, a specialist beats a generalist. Um, so it's well worth, well worth looking at. But also, um, you know, making sure that it, it, it continues to fulfil the requirement of creating happiness with your clients. And yeah. um, uh, after so many interest rate increases, uh, part of the happiness is paying less on your home loan, I Correct. imagine. 
Correct. It's pretty, it's pretty topical and I don't think there's any clients with a mortgage that wouldn't like to uh, be saving on those repayments at the moment. So another one is um, um, after your journey going through this, um, are you, do you guys, are you a member of a community? Do you get any coaching? Who do you learn from outside of your mentors within the business? Yeah, we've got, we've got some formal structures and some informal structures. So um, I potentially like the informal ones uh, more because you sometimes just get some gems. So we catch up twice a year with a, a group of practices um, within the AMP network um, and, and that happened this week. And it's a really open it's a really open group that's happy to share everything. It's a kind of silent sort of discussion. And we'll just go through topics that are all relevant. Yeah. What's your advisor REM structure? How do you incentivize? What's you know, what EBIT are you are you trying to get? Um, what's your you know, what, how would you value businesses if you're doing M and A, et cetera, at the moment? And we all share and yeah, you know, and, and, and that's awesome. Then we have um, formal structures. So we're part of Macquarie Van and we've been with that now for two years. And that's really good. So that takes us outside of our licensee, which is great because sometimes within a within the community, it's got some common thinking about it. Um, so it takes us outside of our licensee, and we meet with some amazing practices that have accelerated their growth really, really quickly. Um, and that's a really good community that's happy to share. Okay? We, we, we were at a catch up there three weeks ago. One of the practices that's done dozens of acquisitions. Um, you know, we've done about six, and they've done. You know, probably fifty, and they just walked us through their whole process around it and said, "We've Wonderful. got a, we've got a, a, a we've got a checklist with three hundred items on it. We'll email it to everyone." So yeah. that's the sort of community I want to be involved in, yeah. where people are open and sharing and happy to pay it forward. And if they get it back, they get it back as a bonus. And look, a sh- shout out to Macquarie who um, have been doing that for many, many years. Yeah. So, so we really enjoy that. I've then got um, some GMs in other practices that we catch up with monthly, and that's probably a bit more granular. And so far as you know, let's go down. So we caught up with them last month, and we went through every line item in the P and Ls, and just said, "Wow." Yeah, your 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 property costs are low and your tech costs are high. This is what we do, and we just share. Yeah, I think um uh, the it's been a long time since any financial planner has really thought any other financial planning company is a competitor. There's 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 an insane amount of clients and a very few amount of practitioners. Correct. So, um, having a think about uh, well, thanks thanks for giving a lot of those details there, Pete. And um, I've, I'm, I'd like to maybe touch on the culture. Because you've got 45 people, you've got people that are, some are full-time, some are part-time, you've got some people that are, are transitioning roles as a function of their tenure, you've got people that are in uh, six locations and also overseas. The questions I'd like to ask you, uh, with that as a backdrop, why do people join you, why do people stay and why do they grow? Fundamentally, they join us because we're really clear on where we want to go. So as a business, um, we set our big, big, hairy, audacious goal um, back in yeah, BHAG back in 2018 and we gave ourselves 15 years to achieve the 15,000 happy clients. We talk about that in the first interview and people know that we're a business that's focused around growth and the reason that we want to achieve 15,000 happy clients is that we think every client that we have influences at least six other people, whether that be their parents, their kids, their communities, which means we'll be influencing over 100,000 Australian lives. And people join us because they want to be part of that. The second reason that people join us is that they really um, understand that, yes, we're clear on where we want to go, so there's no secrets to it, but we're clear on how we want to get there in so far as the way we want to do it, which is our mission of creating happiness. So our, our mission of creating happiness is for, our, is for our team, our clients, and our community. So they understand that we're going to kick back into the communities in which we operate. They understand that we're going to make sure that the clients are not only having a great experience but are getting great outcomes and they understand that as a team member, we can't talk about creating happiness for our clients and our communities if we've got a team that aren't being fully supported given um, developmental opportunities, coaching, training, fun. You know. How does EGM have fun? What, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm going to jump back into your charitable ones and yeah. we've spoken about how you help the clients but I'm really going to hone in on the team here. Yeah. Um, how does EGM celebrate success? All right. So we have six core values, um, fun, innovation, communication, leadership, accountability, and passion. And most businesses that I've worked in you know, will have a variety of those words. Um, they'll have a mission statement and they'll have a variety of values. And at the end of the conference where they create them or communicate them, they go into a draw. 
Um, and in fairness at EJM, when I got there, I asked them for them and the current management in the business went searching through the drawers. So one of the first things I did back in 2014 was we were in a conference and the team came up with the values and the team came up with the mission around creating happiness. But the difference... The difference between, I think, uh, EJM and any business that I've been involved in before is we live and breathe it every day. So the first agenda item on our Monday team meetings is calling each other out for anyone that's gone over and above in creating happiness. Oh, so, so like a bit of a gratitude session. Yeah. Yeah. And in our, in, our, in our original business, which is probably about 28 people because um, we sort of segment the team meetings because it got a bit big, that takes about 20 minutes every Monday. So it's not talked about it at an interview and then not talked about. We live and breathe it. The um, major award we have in the business is the Creating Happiness Award. Okay, and, and tell me about that. So the team vote, you know, as I said, I love the MCG and I love my Aussie rules, so we use Brownlow Medal style voting. So every quarter our team do 3 two, one for the team members that they think live the Creating Happiness mission the most yep. and then they all get you know, grouped together at the end of the year. Um, so that's our main, that's our main award. Uh, and does have, it take three hours to present that award, like Brownlow style? Or? Uh, no, it doesn't quite take that long because we don't like our, our beer getting warm. <laughs> right. Um, but it, it's a really, it's probably the, it, it's in the top few moments I have every year when I get to present that award because it's like your peers have just said you live your, you are the best at living this mission and this mission is everything that we are about. It's the reason I get out of bed. Um, so we live it that way. We have monthly creating happiness awards. And then we challenge ourselves and we're just rolling out in uh, next week or the week after when we do our next range of quarterly team reviews, um, everyone's going to need to be bringing examples of how they've lived each of those six values so, on a quarterly basis. So I get that. That, that sounds really doable when, you, when you've grown this business in one location for a long period of time. How do you manage the cultural integration of, of when you're acquiring businesses or merging? It's it's really really hard from feedback. Um, what's been your success and and what have been your learnable failures? Yeah, so operating rhythm is the main success. So we're really strict. We run we run, run with the Rockefeller habits. So we do. I love the Rockefeller yeah. habits. So we so we do we do daily huddles. We have a front a front of house one, a back of house one. Um, so we've got a team member in Wangaratta who's been with us for a year, and I think I only went to the Wangaratta office four times last year, but I see him every morning. So I feel like I know him as well as I know F, who was our first team member in the Philippines. Um, because I, you know, I used to, when I was doing the back office one, I'd see F every morning. So we interact, and because we've got multi-site, not everyone sees each other anyway. And you were doing this before COVID. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, yeah I know that. And when COVID hit, nothing changed. There you go. Yeah, we, we, in one day, we said, everyone, grab your computers, grab a chair, grab a, whatever you need. And the next morning, we had a team meeting at eight o'clock and it was exactly like our normal team meeting. And you, your, your global team, uh, we're used to dealing with you in that regard anyway. Yeah. So, um, it just meant that everyone's now the same height. Yeah. You're the height but, of a PC. <laughs> yeah. But in the interest of transparency, right? I tried to roll out the huddles three times and failed. Right. <laughs> so I think that's something that maybe in Australian culture, yeah, we're not great at letting people actually fail. And what's a huddle look like, Pete? So a huddles ten to fifteen minutes. Um, every team member has key metrics that they're or key performance measures that they've chosen to report on. Same every day. So, um, for example, if we've got somebody somebody new in our offshore team, um, one of the you know we'll sit with them and say, "What do you think you should report on?" And one of the things will be those me- metrics that just tell me how much is the volume, what's in their pipeline. Because if I can sit there as a as a as a leader in the business and go oh, that person's got 17 in their pipeline and really that should be about four, I know that I can reach out to them straight after the huddle and say, hey, mate, how are you going? Yep. And we don't wait for them to crash and burn and feel the stress and not get any happiness. We're actually going, okay, well, there's a challenge here. How are we going to solve it? So it, it gives you as a leader a really good snapshot. It gets the team engaged and going, wow, yeah, I'm not as busy as that person. Maybe I need to lift my game up. Or, wow, that person's really busy and I've got a bit of a, you know, my workflow's dried up, you know, for whatever reason, or it's a bit light, I'll grab some of their work. And, and, it, and getting these operational rhythms um, uh, with new uh, team members and new new branches, um, uh, you're obviously good at selling it, but um, how, how hard is it actually to get these people who may have come from a different environment into this? Or, or do, is that part of the allure? Is that part of when you're doing your investigation into whether – 
these people will join if they that finally they've found a place that does this. Yeah. So it's it's both. So for some, it's the allure of going, wow, I love the systems, the structure. We don't have this. We don't have the scale to have this. I just want to walk in and that's all taken care of. That's really positive for some. Others, it's I'm really good at dealing with clients and doing this and doing that and, and more meetings and more meetings is taking me away from that, which is actually not not a good thing. So you know, I've made more mistakes. I think that I've made good decisions. Um, one thing that I've learned with the acquisitions is that one of our acquisitions um, we didn't force them into our operating rhythm because they were pretty uh, pretty against it in the due diligence phase. And we're like, well, let's not shake the whole deal up over this. And it took, I don't know, it took about 18 months. And eventually I said, no, the reason that the integration is taking longer than we wanted is because we're not actually getting to know each other. And we just bit the bullet and said, let's do it. And that's been only going for about the last month. And I'm already seeing the connection amongst team members, right? So it's now not I'm at this site. It's I'm part of this bigger team. Sometimes you've got to be good for yeah, people, and, not good to them, isn't yeah, it? And, right? and, and, and I, yeah, it's, the irony is that by thinking I'm looking after them, by not putting that yep. what they perceived as pressure, I'm actually making it harder for them to have fun, enjoy their roles, be successful. And on that, from your own perspective, looking at the way you've evolved, has your leadership style or methodology changed um, over the last 10 years? It's it's changed in so much that I'm more aware of what I don't do well and I'm more aware of needing to have people in the business and structures in the business to counter that. Um, so I need, I need to not try and be there for everybody all the time and let people actually make some mistakes themselves. At times I've been far too hands-on and trying to not let them make those mistakes. So you're changing as you get bigger. You've got to let people you know, have, have the confidence. I'm hugely confident in my team. Um, I just sometimes get involved too much because I don't want them to make the same mistake I made, whereas they probably just need to. It's a bit like raising children yeah. sometimes, and, isn't it? And now I've got to get really clear on what I'll be involved in and what I won't be involved in. So last year I introduced a process like a weekly review process. So every Friday morning I spend an hour and a half. Um, and the first thing I do is look back at my diary for the week and go, is there anything out of any of those meetings that I haven't actioned or et cetera to capture that? But it also makes me evaluate and go, is there any of those things that I shouldn't have done? And I pick up on more and more as, I, as I'm maturing. Eventually, I might be maturing at 47. Um, I'm picking up on more and more going, yeah, I just shouldn't have done that. I, I think probably just for those of you listening, what a great exercise. What a great exercise. Once a week, jumping in and having a look back that week, which is a, a short enough period of time that you can actually remember everything. Yeah. And, and figuring out which are the ones you shouldn't have done and learning from that. Yeah. Um, that's a great one. Thanks. And just for clarity, that doesn't take me an hour and a half because if that took me an hour and a half, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> um, so look back a week, look forward two weeks. And then you, you're actually getting into every week confident that you're prepared for all the meetings that you've got. And I'll tell you what, when I take a Friday off because it's a long weekend or you know somebody offered me a game of golf, um, it hurts me the next week if I haven't looked forward two weeks and, and planned my week. So, yeah, it's a really good process. <laughs> And, and you were talking about the happiness before, and, and um, you, we just went through your team there. You mentioned that you guys do some some charitable um, stuff. Maybe give us an idea because, you know, why people join, why people stay. Um, yeah, operating rhythms, absolutely. We've spoken about that. Um, fun. Well, it's your first. It's the it's the first cab off the ranking yep. in 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 your uh, your, your mission. Um, but yeah, what do you get? How do you give back? And and how does it work in EJM? So traditionally, it's worked in a really ad hoc way, which I think most people do, right? You know, a staff member comes and says, hey, I'm raising money for something. Could the business chip in? And we'd always chip in, but 90% of your staff probably don't have the confidence to ask. Um, we've supported uh, a charity called Cambodian Kids Can because one of our clients set it up and it's a, basically set up a school in a really poor area in Cambodia where girls would traditionally not get to go to school. Families could only afford to send, you know, the sons to school and that girls would be left working in the fields. So we've done a lot of, a lot of stuff supporting them over the years, but it, it's, it hasn't had enough structure. So we've actually got, um, a group of volunteers in our business at the moment. We had our first meeting about it about a month ago and we've set up and put some budget aside this year for what we're calling the EJM foundation. And we're building that with the team. So there's certainly a, a financial element, which means team members can come and request support for things that they want to do. Um, the business can make decisions you know, as to things that we want to support. And so there's a budget there. But we're just working out what that foundation looks like because that foundation can also do things like run charity days, run you know, 
the biggest morning teas and, and jeans for jeans days. Um, maybe they'll end up running the EJM ball every year. I'd love it to get to that level where we raise money for a specific cause on a rotating basis. So that EJM Foundation is a work in progress, but it's got a, a significant, uh, well, it's got $10,000 put aside for it this year and we're going to tie future business um, profitability targets so that if we achieve this, part of the bonus structure will be where we can allocate more money into the foundation. That's awesome. That's really, really good because it, it creates a, a rhythm and a structure around giving, which yeah. um, which as, as, a, as a firm, as it grows, putting those things in place just, um, as you say, people don't want to sort of uh, approach you for an impulse, but if you've got a whole structure like that, then then, then it's um it's one part of the hierarchy of why people join. Yeah, and they'll also be able to approach instead of me, they'll now actually be able to approach the foundation team members who will actually be the one signing off on what we donate to and what we support. So it actually gets rid of that hierarchy level, and they can be approaching someone that they know really well and they're comfortable with. With the um with the with the business um. How often do you, so you mentioned that you, you, you do your daily huddles and you, you've got quarterly meetings. Um, do you get together as one unit? I mean, post COVID, um, is yeah. that, do you, do you have a, a conference? Yeah, or a so, we have an, or? so we have an internal conference. Yep. So post COVID, we've done in February, uh, the last, so March last year, February this year. Um, and that's everybody coming in except our offshore team. Um, so we've got staff, you know, we've got one of our team members in Sydney. We've got people that work in our, in our five offices. Um, we've got one who's about four hours west of Melbourne, just works from home full time. Everybody gets an invite into those conferences, conferences. Two days, a mixture of having fun, some business planning, some, some coaching, some training. Um, you know, we had a great one this year and we, we all had dinner on a floating boat on the Yarra River and it was about 35 degrees and the city just looked amazing. And, you know, it, it, getting together is really, really important. I'm in the car. I will be in a practice every week. I'll be in, in I'll be in, one of our regional sites at least once a week on average. Um, and then we have management team rotating through the regional sites as well. So there's always a physical connection. So you can touch and feel and get a sense for how things are going. And I know that you, I know that you do that. And, um, I think the, the most time we've spent together was actually when you personally went and visited your team offshore as well. Yep. So, so I know that you've, uh, you've, you've, you're very sort of giving of your time. Um, and uh, from their perspective, um, um, in, in, a, in a business that I'm related to, um, they love it when 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 uh, Pete and the team come over. Yeah, and and it's a luxury. It's a luxury I've got as we've got bigger. Like I, I walk into our you know, our Eagle Hawk office, and I get smiles from people that I haven't seen for the last three weeks, and I love that. Yeah, you know? like, and I can go, oh, how's it going? And I might find out something really good, but also might find out a challenge, and it gives me a chance to. To help with that challenge, um, so whether I'm in Wodonga, Wangaratta, you know, Bendigo, or Eagle Hawk, or whether you know, on the two times I've been lucky enough, l- lucky enough to jump on a plane and get over to Cebu in the Philippines, you know, it's a luxury I have that I that I can do now because we're getting bigger, and, and I absolutely love that part of my role. Yeah, and I think that in order to be able to achieve the client's happiness, you've got to have the team's happiness, and that that extends to every member of your team, as 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 we well know. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about Sort of, uh, are you taking on advisors other than acquisitions at the moment? So, are you, you know, are you taking on advisors organically and bringing them through? Yeah. So we have been via the like the professional year. Okay. So we brought two on via that. Um, where, where and how was that experience, by the way? It was it was it was great in so far as it's a long journey to get to there, but it's what it's been really exciting to see two people do it and it's working really well. We need to get some better structure around how we do that and support. And so now with the advice coaches in place, they will run future PY candidates. Um, so that bit's really exciting. What we haven't been doing is recruiting directly from the market um, because as we do acquisitions, we're generally getting enough of our talent acquisition, not just the clients and the business, but we're getting the, the HR solution as part of that. Um, we've got a need this year at some stage to recruit one into um, definitely into the Melbourne office. We're always open as well. We, we sort of stumble across people referred by people who say, oh, look, I've, you know, I've got 60 clients. Um, I'm just trying to work out where my home should be. And so we, 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 we run that hub and spoke model where we actually have people that have shares in our business or equity participants in our business in every site. Okay. So, um, we're always looking for opportunities. So we just haven't done a lot of direct to market recruiting because the acquisitions giving us most of that 
upside. And by just taking that last point and managing um, a sort of a, a, a portfolio of owners, do, does um, your business have a board structure, or, or how does it how does it operate yeah. from to manage the, the stakeholders? Yeah. So we have five members on our board. Um, which is the three individual shareholders and then two rep- representatives of our corporate shareholder. Yeah. Um, so we sign off on the strategy. We sign off, you know, I, as, as CEO, I present the budgets, et cetera. So that, that's really good from an accountability perspective because we, we set a business plan and we don't deviate from it because you've got both the internal and the external people on there. We then have subsidiaries. So the shareholdings is generally in the, so, Brendan, myself, Manny, and our corporate partner own shares in EJM Headco. But then we actually have, we own the majority of the shares in our subsidiaries and then individuals in, in Geelong, in Bendigo, in Wangaratta, et cetera. So there's incentives yeah. for all of those little seeds yeah. that, that, that you guys are co, co, yeah. co-invest. And we're keen to move that through to a, a proper employee share scheme okay. in the future and get everybody on board. Um, what we're... Ideally, what we're trying to build is we end up at 15,000 happy clients. We're trying to create a business model where you come in and you, you've got shares. You know, if you're an advisor, you've got shares in the subsidiary. And then once you meet, we've got five set criteria for that. Once you meet those five set criteria, you can actually roll those shares, which Brendan's done, into the head company. So over time, as we get more of those people in head company, it's a great, um, it's a great succession plan because you don't want to get to 60 and 65 and have a big business, but there's not a market for it. So this way you can actually just sell within the shareholders, a bit of a partnership sort of structure. That's wonderful. And, and, and what, it, what it means is that, you know, why people stay um, is, is one aspect of it. But you've also put a bit of a, a pathway for ownership um, and also liquidity as well, which, um, which is very important because, you know, life happens um, and, and these businesses, these legacy that, that I think you mentioned Manny wanted to have and the 15-year BHAG that you've got, having that ability to have some people being very relevant for five years, 10 years, 15 plus, is, is obviously going to drive that economic engine. So we were talking um, just beforehand about the, the, the you know, how, how happy I was that, that you've moved through the operations side and you're self-proclaimed you've never really done advice and you're now in the CEO. And, and, and I sort of said, well, the whole purpose of – this engine room podcast is to create awareness about the people behind the the advisors and and you know that that promotion of practice practice manager and and ideally at the end of this whole series uh, if I ask the question you know who are the top five practice managers in Australia I'd actually get an answer because right now they're very very hidden and with that in mind what do you see as as your vision? of where practices are going to or where, where the evolution of, of financial planning practices are going to go um, and, and how that's going to impact, um, you know, the, the, the perception from, from um, the, the other stakeholders, such as the general public. I think the, the industry is evolving into a profession and once you evolve into a profession, then from an outside perspective, you can sort of see what the structure's like. It's been a bit hidden up until now. So definitely practices are getting bigger and bigger practices are going to need a management structure, not somebody who's got 150 clients they're looking after and they're doing management on the side. Do you think that's, do you think there's an inevitability about that? Because just the, the, the cost pressures of cost to serve, being able to actually deliver what you want for the client, given the cost pressures, kind of has pushed practices into that. But there are Absolutely. lots of different models, right? So there, yeah. there, are, there are models, there, there, but, but you've got one, but you're saying that they will be getting bigger. But you're already at 45. Yeah, but th- there's no one right model. You know? So I'm a big believer that you can, you, know, you can hit the golf ball a lot of different ways and still land on the green. What you need to do, though, is decide how you're going to hit it. And they, it, I think you need to have – each business needs to have one model at any one time. So we're really clear that our model is to have equity participants in each site they drive the business and we put in that level of management expertise, operational support to enable them to do the stuff that they want to do. Um, as we get bigger, it creates opportunities for our support team so they're not stagnant in roles if they don't want to be stagnant in roles. Great idea. Um, and those development opportunities, not only are, are they great for growing the business, but for me personally, every time you see somebody develop, and take on a new role and, and they've put in the hard yards and they've, they've done the learning and, and taken on the training, well, that's one of the biggest rewards you get in leadership. So internal promotion has to be available for your business to be a growth business. Um, 
businesses are going to get bigger. They're going to amalgamate. They're going to merge. So you got our goal is to find if people, you know, we're looking for practices where they go, we don't actually love the management piece, but I know I've got to do the management piece. So let's get into a business and work with them where they'll do that for us. I can do the bit I love. And there's a there's a group of experts that can do the bit that they do. The bit I like is that you you're going out to those exact cohort, but you you're not taking everything from them. You're saying, well, let's let's reboot and let's let's participate in 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 the synergies we have together and let's co-own this part of the business and and ultimately maybe the the part of the mothership as well. Are you limiting your expansion from mergers and acquisitions just to sort of Victoria or? or? No, um, we have criteria that we want to meet. And I quite often get asked this. Um, you know, we were recently given an opportunity. Um, somebody said, oh, look, we've got this opportunity for you, but it's, it's interstate. And I said, I, I don't care if it's in Terrelgan or Toowoomba. Well, it turned out to be in Toowoomba. <laughs> so we're about the right cultural fit. That's the first thing we need. If we've got the right cultural fit where people have got the right behaviors and are open to growing, learning, um, and, and being part of this creating happiness mission, I'll go wherever those people are and I don't really care where that is. And how that's our, that's our key to success. This creating happiness mission, is that something that that um um we'd be able to share with the community? Just get a bit of an idea of the pillars of how what you mean by that. We can probably, you know, attach some things because if I'm out there and I'm a practice and I know that what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. Um, and I really, you know, especially regional practices. I, I'm, I'm from, from a regional area and I've always, it's, it's always, uh, sort of played on my mind that if you're in a regional practice and you've been that man or that woman of, of, of trust and authority in an area and then you sell your practice and you see your clients walk down the street five years later, it's just doesn't work, you know, unless, unless you've plugged into something that shares your common values. Yeah. So potentially that might be something that we could, we could glean from you so that if anyone's out there and they're thinking, well, I don't mind this peak guy, started as a sailor, then did some sort of renovation, self-proclaimed, you know, not uh, household um, um, kind of, I was going to say, you're not household illiterate because that would be it, but, but you're not that good at, 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 at that compared to your, your um, background. Um, and I want to actually, jokes aside, learn more about your business. What's the best way of reaching out to you? Yeah. Um for me, just you know, give us a call. Shoot us, jump on the website, shoot me an email, give me a call. I make time for anybody who wants to have a chat. If anybody just wants half an hour of advice or if anyone wants to you know, shoot the breeze and go, how do you do this, how do you do that, I, I weekly will catch up with another practice, um, a variety of different practices um, with something they've gone, hey, you, got, you guys look like you do that bit okay. Um, can you give me some insight into that? So reach out. We love to speak to people because you know, if somebody wants to get some knowledge from us or even consider joining us in any capacity, we'd love to speak to you. We're all about creating happiness. So we have this thing, if anybody joins our business, um, they actually have to do speed dating with four of our team members. So it's the final stage in our interview process is 15 minutes back to back with four of our team members. And I ask those team members at the end of it, um, there's no structure, there's no agenda. No swiping. No, no swiping, can't go left or right. And all it is is my team works so hard and are so proud and protective of our culture that they deserve the right to sign off on anybody who's going to come in. And the one question I ask them, is that person going to be committed to creating happiness as much as you are? And if they get the tick off on that, then the person joins our team. Um, that's powerful in our business and it's been something we've done for a long time. So we don't talk about it, we live and breathe it. Um, we're really, yeah, we have a lot of fun. We're really bad at dad jokes. They're part of every huddle, right? Good um, so, yeah, if you don't like dad jokes, we might not be the right place, but you'll get used to them and they are, we do really good ones. Um, but people who want to be part of EJM want to come along for the journey that we're on, um, get out of bed with some energy, get excited, make a difference, and then celebrate when the opportunity is there to celebrate. And, look, the the premise of, of um, the engine room is, 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 I suppose, you know, articulating, um, the, the power that comes from that correct operations and correct structure as, or, or best practice. Um, but, but the byproduct of it is, is that we're basically giving people an opportunity to listen, to find out who are their kind of people. Um, so I'd like to thank you, um, on, on, on behalf of Ensemble. I'd like to think that Ensemble, um, plays a part, not just in promoting 
financial advisors, but the whole ecosystem. We want to know that, that people who are in practice management, in para planning, people in, in client service and everyone, people from their PY year onwards can find a home and a community um, in the same way that, that you've got your own community there. Um, and we want to put forward really positive businesses, stories and careers. With that in mind, thanks very much, Pete, for your time today. And um, I wish you all the success in hitting your BHAG. Thanks, Roxy. Always good to catch up. 